Sebastian Oreb. Thank you for joining me on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Where's Where's Oreb from? Croatia. That's actually my mum's surname. Uh, my parents split up. My dad is British. Actually, my original surname was Johnston, uh, but my mum brought me up, so I took her surname. Her surname. So you got a bit of British in you. So there's I a bit. Do. There's a bit of good in you. Fifty percent. We can call it good. We could uh, debate on that topic, but we'll say good for now. So, if I was to introduce you, I would think of you as a strength coach. But if you were to introduce yourself to people listening, how would you introduce yourself? Keeping in mind, my listeners, probably majority of female mm. and general pop, which a lot of people would think you haven't trained, but you have. But if you were to introduce yourself, how would you introduce yourself? I, I think about this a lot because I have to tell people my occupation a lot. And the uh, description I always write down is personal trainer because it's the easiest one to explain. But I am an educator and I am a strength coach and I run an online business and I, that's, that's pretty much it. So, so personal trainer is where I started and that's pretty much what I, my, my specialty is. We have a lot of parallels. I was thinking about this today mm. uh, where very much the same, but I bet if you're wearing a nice watch and nice trainers and you're staying in a nice hotel and someone's making conversation, they go, what do you do? And you go, I'm a personal trainer. They give you a weird look. Like, why is he lying? Because the majority of, I suppose, personal training can seem like a very ordinary job. Mm. You started off in fitness first. I started in fitness first and it was an interim job actually um, because I was always told there was no money in the industry. Um, but I wasn't good at anything else. So I was, uh, I was making decent money as a personal trainer. Um, my first job was $70 an hour and it took me about a month before I was earning... Uh, you know, in my early 20s, I was earning a couple of grand a week for, for that age. It was good. And I thought I wasn't in any rush to pursue my career in anywhere else uh, until I... We've got an aeroplane going over the yeah, top of us. Yeah, the, the, the beauty of being in this area. And uh, until uh, 2010, when I had my first daughter, I thought I need to start doing something seriously. I never really thought about being an adult uh, until I had my first daughter. And uh, so I thought I, I didn't know how I was going to transition into a better career. So I started uh, spending a lot of money and time and effort on educating myself in this field. And just I, I didn't know where I wanted to go. I just wanted to be good at what I was doing, which was still personal training. I wasn't uh, coaching any professional athletes. And um, that's, that's uh, the basis of, of how I am what I'm doing now. And what you're doing now... You, you're a strength coach for maybe some people not well known, but then other people who are very well known. Yeah. So Thor Bjorn, Bjornsson. Thor Bjornsson. So he is uh, notable at the moment for just having a boxing match with Eddie Hall. <laughs> yeah. So you've just come from a boxing session this morning. Yep. Was, was there like a discussion in the powerlifting community, like a group WhatsApp where everyone's like, yo, we, we, we've seen Jake Paul. We need to start hitting each other. Um, it seems like that was the trend. And I'm sure that the promoters of his fight uh, were, were along those lines. But actually, uh, contrary to much uh, belief, Thor and Eddie hate each other's guts. And uh, actually, it was a discussion that I had with Thor. Uh, I think it would have been around 2018. I said, it would be good if you guys had a boxing fight. And he said, I'd love to punch that guy. And uh, this was before I, I, like he thought that he was going to continue as a strong man. He didn't think it was actually going to happen. Uh, but they've, they've wanted to punch each other for a long time. I actually was sat on the fence going, nah, these guys are mates. These guys are, you know, just making a kind of spectacle to mm. actually have, but they, they dislike each other. With a passion, with a passion. Eddie Hall and I don't like each other either. Eddie Hall doesn't like me either. Right. So he did, a, he was one of his first, there was a, a corner he turned. I admire him as an athlete. Mm, sure. I watched his documentary, even a few years ago when it first came out, quite a few years ago. I posted it on my Facebook saying, people, you should watch this. Mm. This is hard work, determination, grit, whatever. But then he turned a corner where everything became commercially interested. Mm -hmm. And he started promoting a business, something to do with breakfast. And he wasn't factually correct. And I said, oh, it's quite sad to see someone in this position doing this. Yeah. I didn't tag him. I actually hate tagging people in posts when I'm out in them. Mm. So I'm like, oh, it's a bit cringy. Mm -mm. And then other people tagged him and he's in the comments. And I was like, oh God. Did he jump uh, in? Uh, he did a bit, nothing too bad. But I thought if any reason to continue with jujitsu, it's in case I bump into him at body power. Yeah. 
so I can go feet or if he tries to grab hold of me. But you've been, you've been boxing yourself. What was the kind of ambition to get into that? Um, for me, I'm, I'm not a tough guy. I'm not going to step in the ring. I'm not going to fight Jake Paul. Uh, um, unless it came my way, obviously it would be a lucrative offer, but I doubt that'll ever ha happen. Um, it's because I want to uh, get fit. I want to improve my health. Um, I'm a power lifter. That's, that's what I'm very good at. Um, but being a high level power lifter, that's an extreme sport and it's quite unhealthy, uh, especially the way that I was doing it, which was, uh, you know, eat, eat big to lift big. And uh, during COVID, I had no one to impress, nowhere to go. Everyone was locked down. So I just kept on eating and lifting because, you know, I own this gym. And, you know, while a lot of people were locked down and don't have gym access, I did. And, you know, I'm married. I don't have girls to go and pick up or chase. So I just kept on eating, kept on lifting. And I was lifting some, some really great numbers that were, uh, you know, if I competed, it would have been up there. Uh, you know, in the top 10 in the world. And, you know, no competitions were happening. So I just kept on going, kept on going to the point where um, I couldn't walk across the road because uh, I'd get such painful, debilitating back pump. Um, so I just would never do it. And I've got all of the, my team that I work with going across the road, getting coffees for me, getting lunch for me. And I just sit here very muscular, but also um, kind of like an obese dude. So super unhealthy. There's been a lot of comments online, especially with Thor Bjornsson about how much healthier he's looking. Absolutely. And whether or not the decision not only was commercially uh, beneficial, but also for longevity. Because oh, yeah. he's, he's a brand outside of just being someone who can lift tremendous amounts of weight. And yeah. people, I think, can misinterpret. I could be wrong with this, but at any stage in your life when you're carrying excess tissue, that's a lot of strain on the cardiovascular system to support. Mm. And whether that's fat, which is negative connotation, or muscle, which is often given a super positive connotation, mm. it's a lot of effort for cardiovascular systems to keep up with. 205 kilograms, put that into perspective. So me feeling, you know, uncomfortable, I was 120 kilograms. So throw an extra 85 kilograms on top of that. Obviously, he's six foot nine and can hold more mass than me, but still, it's not healthy. Um, his heart is working overtime. His, uh, I don't know his exact age. I think he's like 35 or something like that. Um, but, uh, you know, time goes by and he'll be 40 before you know it. And he's got kids and a family. And uh, the, the strong man at his level is, if, I, if I'm saying powerlifting at my level was extreme, that's, this is beyond extreme. Uh, to the point where it's like, he, he just has to stop. He's actually had doctors tell him uh, for World's Strongest Man 2019, he had the doctors call him up saying, you're not allowed to compete. The thickness of your heart is that, it was, whatever it was, I don't know the exact, the anatomy of it, it was 14 millimetres, the thickness of, of the wall. And they said, that's the limit. That's where we tell you, you're not allowed to compete. And I saw him on the phone saying, I'm begging you guys, don't do this to me. I've got my whole family who have spent money to, to come and watch and support me. Don't do this to me. And I was thinking wow, this guy's going to drop dead on, you know, in competition just because he didn't want his family to waste money on their plane tickets. And uh, it, was, it was a really scary moment watching that happen. Anyway, he, he, he did everything right. He did everything by the books and he, he got a second opinion from the doctors and they passed him. I don't know how legitimate that pass was, but uh, that was his last competition. And when I saw him say, um, you know, let, let's, let's talk more about money, um, the the, the highest paid strongman competition was, I think it was like the Arnold's, or I think his, his biggest payday was his 501 kilogram deadlift. He got paid 100 grand. You know, he does multiple events per year, so it's not just 100 grand per year. Um, you know, plus he's got sponsorships and things like that. But to be the best in the world, like you, you compare it to, to football, to basketball, these guys are millions, millions per, per season. Uh, strongman, the, the best in the world, There's, he's stronger than 8 billion people in the world. And to get paid $100,000 for that, to risk your life like that, it's absolutely not worth it. So for him to make that decision, to get paid to punch someone in the face that he doesn't like, um, which would, A, yeah, get, gets paid more. B, um, he gets to lose, he lost 50, 55 kilograms in a very short time. His heart would be thanking him for that. And same with his family in the long run. So from a, a longevity standpoint, he's added years to his life 
And uh, if he, of course, I love Strongman, I love Thor, he's the best in the world. And I would love to see him push the limits. So when people say, you know, tell him to do it, it's like, I, I would love to, I, I'm not gonna lie. Um, but he's absolutely doing the right thing by never competing in Strongman ever again, as much as I would love to see it, because I still think that if he went back to Strongman this year, he would dominate again. Um, but, it, you know, that increased the risks of him dying. If you look at some of the greats as well, it's only 15, 20 years after they stop, you see the implications. Like Ronnie Coleman, you may, you see him in his prime, you go, this is amazing. Everyone's like, more and more. Mm -hmm. You know, let's see more videos, lightweight. Then you see him where he can't walk. And you're like, oh, the price of impressing people in his prime mm. literally deteriorated his older life. Mm. And you feel that some people were amazing at having get outs. Arnold Schwarzenegger, probably one of the best, where of still competent, moves into political roles, does all these yeah. other things. But yeah, it is one of those. And unfortunately, there are so many people, even from the golden era of powerlifting and strongman, who they fade away into history very, very quickly. And they probably left with the questions of, was it worth it? Absolutely. And, and the fact is, you have to be pretty, like Ronnie Coleman has, uh, you know, a few better accolades than, than uh, Thor Bjornsson because, you know, Mr. Olympia pays better. Uh, you know, it probably set him up a little bit better, but still, I, I don't think it would be worth it for him. I, I'm sure I, that everyone's heard the interviews where he says, you know, any regrets? And he says, I regret not doing one more rep. It was like, I forget what it was, it was like a 700 pound squat or something like that. Um, I don't think that he's serious when he says that. Of course, people want to honour their decision, you know, but, oh damn, you know, age comes along real quick and uh, the price that they, you know, the, the amount of, um, the reward they get uh, for, for achieving greatness at that level is absolutely not worth it. Um, you know, it's certain sports, unfortunately, being the best in the world at bodybuilding and even fighting as well. You were talking to me before about, you know, you're rubbing shoulders with some of the best fighters in the world. And it's such an amazing thing that everyday people like you and I uh, can hang out with the best of the best. Uh, you know, it's, it's equivalent to if we were to play basketball and hang out with LeBron James, like that would be unheard of. Um, but it's just, it's not as as big a sport. Um, so so it, it's a great privilege to, to hang out with the best of the best, but they don't get the credit that they deserve. I have a personal anecdote as well with uh, using anabolics in my 20s. First three times I felt amazing. You know, and I say to people openly, they go, what's it like? I go, oh, it's, it's amazing to be on super abnormal amounts of testosterone. But there was one cycle where I just didn't feel great. I was very red in the face. I assumed blood pressure. I couldn't tan. Every time I went out in the sun, even for like 10 minutes, I'd look burnt. Mm. And people were commenting on my videos in the very early days. And generally just didn't feel good. And when it came off, I never had so many people say to me, I looked healthier. Mm. They were like, when you're getting bigger, they won't really say anything. They're like, oh, you put on a bit of size. Mm. But then when I came off, they're like, oh my God, man, you look great. Mm. They were like, you look so much healthier. And I felt better. And <laughs> for me, that was the last time I was going to dabble with it. And that's from a recreational point where I, was, I wasn't using them for titles or body, but I was using them for trying to bury insecurities. Yeah. And I, what worries me now is the amount of people that are trying to do this. I mean, have you seen the amount of uh, hair transplants that are happening at the moment? Mm. Like I was saying to someone the other day, I was like, it's, it's, it's pretty normal. Mm. A lot of people lose their hair. Then you've got a lot of hard gainers and they refuse to accept that they have to play the cards they're dealt with. And instead are going to these crazy means of, you know, taking anabolic steroids without any prior understanding of it. With your time as a trainer and a strength coach, have you come across people that have, you know, abused steroids in a bid to... Many, to many. And, and that's the problem. It's, there's, you know, a lot of people ask me to speak about it publicly. Uh, maybe one day I will uh, be a little bit more open to it. But for now, when I give my, uh, my advice and recommendations publicly, it's always uh, to not go down that path. I've seen it uh, with, with many people. And it's just not healthy. A lot of people consider it. Oh, it's, it's okay. You know, I'm a hard gainer. It's a quick fix. I want the abs. I want the, the muscles. I want whatever comes with it. They think that there's some, something magical at the end of, you know, building all this muscle and having a six pack or whatever it is. Uh, just to, to find out <laughs> that's not the case at all. Uh, but what they're left with is, is a fucked up endocrine system that they end up having to, to pay for for the rest of their lives. Um, it's not like an ecstasy pill uh, where you take a pill and you spend a weekend recovering and, and then you're back to normal the next day. Um, they're, they're doing long-term damage. And it's not just um, on, on their hormones. Um, you know, depression is a huge thing. And something that I see a lot of 
Um, this is going to be a very controversial topic, but a lot of steroid users are depressed. They're depressed. So, you know, as you said, a lot of people will be taking it for their insecurities to begin with. Those insecurities don't go. It's a Band-Aid. Uh, you know, they're going to get rid of their insecurities by adding on a little bit of muscle. They're the same person inside. Um, anyway, how long can you do that for? How long is that sustainable? Age catches up to everyone, hopefully. Hopefully it catches you, unless you die early, which is something <laughs> that can happen as well. You know, a lot of people complain about aging. It's a privilege, actually, um, that some people, unfortunately, don't experience. Um, but yeah, the, the, the whole steroid topic, um, people need to take it a little bit more seriously. And a lot of people throw around the topic and ask me, uh, as, as I said, one day I'll be a little bit more vocal with my opinions on it. Um, but th there's, there's, I guess I could sum it up by saying that it's not an ecstasy pill. Do your freaking homework. And like people developing breast tissue, like uh, gyno and people having to have surgery to remove mm -hmm. that. Like there are people out there that get gyno without taking steroids yep. and it's life changing for them. When people, you know, I chat to people and they go, oh, you know, I just came off. I said, there was no therapy. They're like, no, they're like, oh, I can't even run in a t-shirt anymore since I've done it. Mm -hmm. There, it's even with like bariatric surgery, weight loss surgery, you're only given the top 10%. You skim the top off the milk and go, look how amazing this is. And all the people that have issues kind of hide it and never talk mm -hmm. about it. And it kind of gets buried, creating this almost echo chamber to it. And people ask me about CrossFit and I love to have a pop at CrossFit because it's funny, but mm -hmm. CrossFit was almost my saving grace because I'd come from six years of just training to get big. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I took a cycle and I was playing rugby in my early 20s, I could barely run. And my mates, they all knew I was on gear because they would be like, oh, you're on gear. The worst thing they did was to wind me up on the bus after a few beers. They go, oh, void rage. I go, I'm, I haven't got void rage. And then Calm down. they'd wind me up a bit. And then I'd be like, mate, fuck off. <laughs> they'd be trying to get me to drink. And they'd be like, oh, there's the void rage. But I still fucking void rage. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's one of those things that it was, it was all too easy to acquire. And even it's in some cases cheaper than getting a full supplement stack. Mm. But the, yeah, the kind of, the hurdles with all of that. For me, I went to CrossFit. I was m mocking a girl that I was dating that did it. She had come to one session. And at the end, I was like, I kind of really enjoyed that. And I moved into a world where suddenly it wasn't about how big I was or how much I was lifting. It's how hard I was working. Mm. I wanted to stretch more. I wanted to sleep more. Mm. And then jujitsu was then another level up from me there where I was wearing a gi to training. It didn't matter. If I gained five kilograms, no one was judging me for that. They were just worried mm. about getting caught underneath it. Mm. Uh, you had a stint in jujitsu as well. I did um, probably over a decade ago. Um, and then that was actually one of my decisions that I had to make. So as a personal trainer, wanting to be good at what I did, um, I knew that, well, I didn't know. I just, my, my own um, thought process was if I wanted to be good at something, just double down on, on, on one thing. I don't try and do everything. And so I was doing boxing, I was doing jujitsu, I was doing, you know, powerlifting or trying to, and, and I was very average at everything. And then, uh, when I had uh, 2010, when I had my first daughter and I, I knew that I wanted to, to be successful in my life, I doubled down on what I was best at, which was powerlifting. So I stopped everything. I stopped uh, all of the martial arts training as, as much as I loved it. I just wanted to be really, I just wanted to excel in one field and that was weight training. So that's, uh, you know, now I'm, I'm kind of doing a, a bit of a 360 where I'm coming back to that point. Uh, and I'm, I'm loving boxing. Uh, I would do jiu-jitsu, but now that I'm 40 years old and I've spent 10 years at powerlifting at an elite level, uh, my knees, my hips, my shoulders, they get a little bit banged up. Uh, so, yeah, so boxing is probably the lowest impact of the, the martial arts that I could choose. There was a, the first time we met was actually at dinner in Bondi. We went to Raw Bar yep. and I bumped into you there. And uh, did you say that you got your blue belt and then you got in a fight? <laughs> It's funny, it's like you put up a post uh, not long ago about, um, you know, when you get your jiu-jitsu belt and you get in a street fight and you lay down on the floor, you know, hold up, let me do it properly. It was, uh, I can definitely relate to that. Of course, I didn't ask the, the guys to, <laughs> to, to wait up while I laid on my back. Um, but yeah, I was, uh, I had a blue belt in jiu-jitsu and uh, I had a lot of confidence and I had a little bit more, more confidence that night in particular because I was drunk. And uh, three guys... Uh, looked at me funny and, you know, I held my own because I had a blue belt in jiu-jitsu, right? So I held my own and um, one of them said to me, you know, I forget the exact conversation. It was along the lines of, what are you looking at? And my reply was, what the fuck are you looking at? And, um, you know, he and I went head to head and as I've grabbed him, his, his buddies were 
you know, punching me on the side of my head. And I thought, this isn't meant to happen, <laughs> you know. Uh, but it did happen. And it was, it, was a, it was a wake up call, actually. And that's why I started boxing. I still love jujitsu. Uh, but anyway, when I box now, I'm not boxing so I can be a tough guy. Yeah. I don't want to fight people. I, I just, I, I love the sport. I love watching it. Uh, and I want to improve my cardiovascular health. And I'd rather uh, learn a skill while I'm doing that than, for example, going for a jog, um, which I don't enjoy. <laughs> There's a, I did a bit of boxing in lockdown when gyms were closed mm. at a coach I worked with. And the same thing, I didn't, he didn't even really want to spar. Mm. There is a definitely combative brain work or part of our brain loves combat mm. doesn't like getting hit or beaten up but the idea of ducking dodging throwing punches it's the competitive nature we all have and it kills me that some people don't in their life ever dabble with that because even with jiu-jitsu boxing powerlifting strongman these are all competitive things mm. and i think that it, you know a big red flag for me even dating someone was if they're not involved in a competitive sport mm. everything to me becomes competitive and mm. what i wanted to understand a bit more was you became a strength coach, you started powerlifting. How was that kind of journey? Because for me, not many of my followers are powerlifters. Mm. So sometimes I'm like, oh, you know, five reps, that's 10, to, 10 too, too few or whatever. Yeah. Cause I'm talking to that demographic, but there is a huge amount of people love lifting heavy shit. Mm. What, tell me about the psychology of that. What you've kind of witnessed, the kind of personality traits, is it? shy people that want to prove to themselves they're strong is it strong people just trying to be the biggest man in the room i want to understand more about who powerlifters are so um i i guess um my interpretation is a little bit distorted at this point because i'm in a position where the people that come to me i just saw one of my athletes outside he's about to come in here he's dieting at the moment and he's 150 kilograms uh, at his heaviest he's 180 185 kilograms you know just over 400 pounds for your american audience and uh, this is the type of audience that I have, uh, uh, my, my clientele that I uh, am surrounded by. These are the people that come to me and say, I can bench press 200 kilograms, how do I get more? Or I can squat 300 kilograms, how do I get more? So I'm, I'm not um, as savvy with, with general population these days. Of course, I started with general population. But it's just, I, I guess... Um, when I first started as a personal trainer and, and wanting to further my education and become a better coach, I looked for the need in my audience and I found that every single one of the people that I was coaching had some type of injury or dysfunction. So uh, the path that I went down was, was educating myself on rehabilitation. And the funny thing was what I learned about rehabilitation was strength was one of the best answers. I don't want to say it's the only answer. Sometimes tongue in cheek, I do say that. Um, I have a huge bias towards strength for everything. Um, but it's definitely an excellent answer. And I, I found that through rehabilitating my clients, um, all of them got incredibly strong. And I'm talking about general population, mothers, fathers, business owners, um, all genders, all ages, were, were my, my clients were the strongest in the gym. They were stronger than some of the personal trainers. And they weren't competitive athletes either. Um, and that was... Uh, more rewarding for me than you know lifting your shirt up and and looking to see how the six pack is going pinching your skin to see if you're improving i love objective feedback so uh, we can objectively measure our progress uh, with the, the amount of weight we're lifting the weight on the bar rather than as i said the subjective measurements looking at your abs in the mirror or whatever it is that no one actually gives a shit about anyway like uh, metabolism as well. People are like, oh, this is great for your metabolism. Who the fuck is measuring their metabolism? <laughs> oh, you know, you know, fasting is uh, great for your hormone. I'm like, who's, who's doing your fucking blood work? <laughs> and like, even there are so many nuances with that where if you take someone's blood work and they're afraid of needles, you're going to get a different blood reading and blood pressure totally. reading. I fucking hate that. And like, like you say, strength is such an easy metric. There are obviously variables, you know, where you're on your menstrual cycle, what time of day you're training, totally. how much caffeine you've had. But totally. ultimately, strength is something where they step out from the rack and you go, that's the most you've ever lifted. Yeah. Or the first time uh, a woman gets a chin up, first time a guy gets a fucking chin up. And I agree with your philosophy there. Some people are like, oh, you know, injuries is imbalance or it's lack of range of motion. I'm like, fucking be strong. And I, I struggle very much to balance weight training with jujitsu because I like one more than the other now. But whenever I feel niggles coming, I know I just need to give up a little bit of jujitsu and do more in the gym. Mm. And it never has to be complex. Mm. It just has to be 
you know, lower body, pick something up, squat something, push something, pull something. And I know that gets, again, really thrown about, but I agree that I think people are injured because of weaknesses. And, you know, it, it sounds almost oversimplistic to say that joint ligament or muscle strained because it couldn't handle the load. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'm, I'm a big believer in that as well, where 60 year old, fucking 80 year old sitting down on a plyometric box and standing back up, we're going to make the person stronger, therefore less likely to get injured. Um, but yeah, the, the, the kind of culture that you've been in immersed and the chalk slapping on the back and the smell insults. I actually only really fully experienced that when I came here and trained with you probably as far back as 2019. And I fucking loved it. Right. I'd come in here, you go, how much weightlifting you done? I'd be like nothing over hundred kilograms and how long 15 months and like cranking the music, getting the smell insults, cans of uh, monster energy drinks. It's actually a really fun environment. If I'd seen that in a commercial gym, I would have thought you lot are fucking mental. And you, you, uh, you touched on this. I listened to one of your first podcasts you did with Dinny and Felicia where you took that culture into commercial gyms. And got kicked out. And got kicked out. Because of it. Yeah. It's intimidating. And I totally get that. Um, and, and yeah, I was essentially, so from Fitness First, that's, that's what happened. So as I started rehabilitating people, started noticing that people were getting stronger, um, then, then it kind of merged into that and, and training people for strength. And then it started attracting that audience. Um, so what I was getting better at, uh, the, the better I got at it, the, the more, uh, yeah, the more it attracted that, that audience. So it merged into, okay, we're all strong. So what do strong people compete in? They compete in powerlifting. Uh, let's try that. So, so that's how it attracted powerlifters. And then it's like, how do powerlifters train? And to be honest with you, I had a very uh, distorted interpretation of what it meant to be a powerlifter back then as well. So I've changed a lot in my time. Over the last 10 years, uh, you know, everything was about the, the back slapping and the, the chalk smelling and, and the screaming and all of that. Um, it's changed a lot. There's not a huge amount of screaming these days. It's a little bit more focused and a little bit more calculated what we do. Uh, and it's not just about, um, you know, beating yourself up and, and the heavy metal and all of those things. Um, it, it, actually, a lot of the powerlifters in my community are quite intelligent and the strongest people that you see, if you spoke to them, they're very intelligent. And, and actually, they know a lot more about training than a lot of uh, educated personal trainers. So educated personal, personal trainers may know a lot about training, you know, as, as you'd open a book and read about it. Uh, but then the practical applications, these powerlifters who aren't in the industry, they have regular jobs, uh, would do a much better job at teaching people how to move. And a lot of people look at it and they're intimidated by it, which is actually a downfall for, for me from a business standpoint. A lot of people look at me and they say, that's great. I'll take a photo with him or, or whatever. I'll shake his hand. I'll like his post where they're, they're doing abnormal amounts. But that's as far as it goes because that doesn't apply to me. So, so this is actually my, my new venture is to... It, I don't want to say new venture. I, you know, I collaborated with my wife and her sister. They're called Base Body Babes. They're 50 kilo girls who are, you know, they are strong for their size, but how strong can you possibly be as a 50 kilogram human? Uh, the answer is not very compared to my 150 kilogram to 200 kilogram humans. Uh, so, so initially I, I you know, joined forces with them to popularize the idea of strength training amongst the masses. And... Um, yeah, it's, it's uh, slowly, slowly progressing. And, and as you talk about CrossFit and how much you actually love it, I, I'd hate doing it because my, that's not my, my thing. I'm not fit and uh, I, I'd probably die after you know, a very short session. But actually, I love what they've done for the fitness industry and the strength world in particular. Uh, and, and even more to that, for the female population, uh, popularizing barbell movements um, you know a lot of people talk about their favorite methods of training and all of these things I, I don't care anymore so it's like you don't have to love powerlifting I, I absolutely don't care um, I'm more about the, the long game and what type of training methods are going to allow you for, to train long enough to achieve the result you can't come in for a session and get a six pack you can't come in for a week or, or six weeks or whatever it is eight week challenge like of course that's a great start but if you want good results in anything that you do, as you said, you know, you, you've got a purple belt in jiu-jitsu and you've been doing it for four years. How much, how much longer to get your black belt? Probably another five. <laughs> you, you know, so that's a, that's, wow, that's a, a big commitment, right? But that's how long it takes to be good at anything. I say quite often it takes 10 years to become an overnight success. And um, that's where I found I was able to, to 
achieved the best results with whoever I worked with was to change my focus from how you look in the mirror to how you're performing in the gym. And in my opinion, with the audience that I was attracting, um, it just seemed to, to produce a much better result to, to work on someone's progression and give long-term goals in, in how much weight they can lift to allow them uh, to, to want to continue training to be able to achieve these goals rather than aesthetic goals, you know. It's interesting you say that because the exact same kind of ideology with women where I, they come in and I go, look, in the next 10 weeks, I can't make you love yourself. I can't make you really accomplish the things you've just said. But what I can do is I can make you strong, I can make you stronger. I can make you surprise yourself. And then, like you say, barbell movements, squats, deadlifts. I find it amazing how much quicker women get strong because they move very well in general. Mm. From, you know, I've probably not worked with as many as you have, but with dudes, you're like, well, that's the deepest you can go. And um, then the look on their faces when they progress in the strength world, you know that's more than just physiological. And then suddenly you start seeing them split squat, great amounts of weight, rear foot elevated split squat. And then you see the guys in the gym looking at them loading 20s on the barbell hip thrust. And I think that, you know, weight training, barbells, I'll probably get slammed for this, and high-waisted leggings <laughs> was literally probably one of the best things for women because it took the focus away from having to get lean, shredded, and have veins sticking out your stomach and instead put the onus on saying, hey, let's make you strong. And then they might look to themselves and go, hey, I want to be a fucking weapon in the gym mm. more than I want to be malnourished on a beach. The, the fact is that a lot of people look past is that's a side effect of training properly actually does make you achieve your aesthetics goals as well. It's just not the prime focus. So when we're putting all of the effort into uh, lifting weights and being strong and achieving these, these milestones in numbers, you've got to do everything right. So it's not just about eat big, lift big mentality. That is definitely a thing, but it's not the best way of, of being good, actually. Health needs to be considered if you want uh, to be in anything for the long game. So uh, actually a lot of my athletes, even though they're big and muscular, they improve their body composition. They improve their total aesthetic. And I work with women who've won world championships in bikini modeling competitions or fitness model competitions through strength training. So unfortunately there is a stigma around, and this, is, this was my misinterpretation originally when I got into powerlifting. It was, it was not so much about, let's not focus on aesthetics, let's only focus about the performance. But it was more about, fuck your aesthetics, let's focus on performance, which is, which is the wrong thought process. Um, actually, uh, when you train like an athlete, so it's a bit of a cliche saying, train like an athlete, you might end up looking like one. Now, nutrition comes into that. And nut nutrition is a huge, plays a huge role in your success in being strong as well. Uh, you know, of course, you know, calorie consumption. I know you talk hugely on calorie deficit. Most of my audience is, is more about the calorie surplus. So we're on the other end. I, I rarely get people that come in and want to lose weight. Um, but my audience that want to gain weight, it's not about like gaining fat is, is unhealthy. Um, you know, it's, you know, quality mass and it's a long procedure. You can't do these things overnight. And the amount of quality mass that you can build in a year is actually not much, unfortunately. You know, so, so even to be good, at, to be actually strong, um, you need to put the time in, just like you with your jiu-jitsu, 10 years to get a black belt from beginner level, you know, roughly. Um, I, <clears throat> I don't know if, um, if, if you've seen it, but I trained my daughter. She's 12 years old, and I'm not a fanatic with her at all. Of course, I want her to be awesome in every way possible, but I also understand one of my highest priorities is a, is a thing called training morale. If you hate what you're doing, the likelihood that you're going to spend enough time on it to be good at it is quite low. So I try and make whatever it is with training enjoyable for everyone that I work with. Do you know where they say, I think John Donner has said this, he goes, two reasons people quit jiu-jitsu, it's too hard or it's too boring. He goes, it's not too hard. And I, every time I've maybe even left a class at training that wasn't fun, I, I'll bring it up with the owner. I'll be like, look, and they've given me a class now. I'm teaching very early and I've said to people, this will not be boring because mm. it has to be enjoyable. Mm. And the way we look at people being motivated, when you were saying that about nutrition and composition, it makes me think about business where if someone comes in and goes, I want to be rich, I'm like, oh, I won't get on with you. Mm. Like, because profit is the, is the outcome, it's the result, but it's not the intention. <laughs> the intention is to run a business. And if you 
have an online business that's designed to help people and mitigate their problems, you will earn money. Mm -hmm. If you go into business just to make money, you're not going to get it the same way that with training or if someone goes, I just want to look like an absolute rig. I'm like, I feel mm -hmm. like your motivators are in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. You want to be able to, you know, impress yourself with your weight training. You want to mm -hmm. be able to break boundaries you've never done before. And as an outcome, you're probably going to look like a, a rig. And I think that there's, when we're looking at motivation, you've got extrinsic and intrinsic where extrinsic is only to avoid bad things happening. So if I take an obese client in the gym and their only motivator is I don't want to have a heart attack, mm -hmm. they're not going to wake up and go, yes, let's go train. Mm. But if they find that training personally rewarding in whatever sense, they will, they will do it. If mm. it's fulfilling them, they'll do it. Mm. And like you say, they were training your daughter. You want her to find that, that moment with her dad weightlifting fulfilling, but there are no skip days. When people start making excuses or they start skipping things, you can always come back to that motivation it's lacking. It's mm -hmm. not there. You're you're doing this for the wrong reason. Mm -hmm. I think you probably become an expert at spotting that from a mile away. It, it's without that, it's not going to work. Um, so without the the training morale, without enjoying what you do, uh, it's exactly that. You need to enjoy the process. And if you don't enjoy the process, it's it's you're not going to put be able to put the time and energy into it to be good enough at it to to achieve that goal that you're after of whatever it is, get rich, look like a rig, uh, be a world champion. And even in the strength game, I get a lot of young kids come and go that have huge potential, um, but it's just the wrong focus. They come in and they, they see what is possible. They see the people that I'm working with and they say, this is what I want. And if, if it doesn't happen in the first year or the, the you know couple of years, uh, they just quit. They get up and leave and move on to do nothing in particular. Um, so, so, you know, Back to my daughter, of course I want her to, to want to do this because this is my passion as well. And actually I've got a great career for her lined up uh, if she wants it. Like we've got a great business. We, we own this whole, whole setup and it's, it's a perfect uh, you know, future for her if she wants to continue, but I'm not going to force her. Um, I'm going to, of course, point her in the right direction so that hopefully she makes those decisions, but I've got to make it enjoyable for her because if I don't, um, she's going to hate it. I'm not sure if you've ever seen, um, I, I don't know his name, uh, something Sozak, uh, the, the mini Hercules, he had long hair, really handsome young boy, very muscular, very ripped. His dad was a fanatic and forced him to train and he was an absolute beast. He was a martial artist, did the splits, did all these fancy things. Uh, anyway, I'm sure some of your audience will know exactly who I'm talking about. Years down the track, uh, I, I just recently saw a video of him. He's got not a drop of muscle on him. He's fat, out of shape, and he's a stuntman. Yeah, he, he jumps off buildings on fire kind of thing for a living, and he doesn't train in the gym because he fucking hates it. I've heard the same with uh, dentists. You'd think their kids have immaculate <laughs> teeth, but because the parents are so uh, trying so hard to manage them to have clean teeth, that they eat loads, they, they'll binge on sugary snacks, and they have some of the worst teeth ever. And you also see this with extremist, uh, like say Christian families. The daughter goes to a girls' school, ends up going to a same uni as me, and I've seen them, and they're they're goers. So like wherever there's too much restriction or force things on people later on in life, it comes back to get them. Now there's one thing that I'm fascinated about, and it's seeing mastery in people's professions. And even I'll get stuck on TikTok watching a bricklayer. I'm like, wow, that's amazing the way mm. he's like mixing mm. the cement or whatever. Mm. And I've experienced it a few times, and I'm not just saying this to suck you off, but when I was here training with you, I, I've witnessed this with you and Sonny, actually, where uh, I was doing a deadlift. Uh, it was relatively heavy. I think it was like 190, 200. And I failed the lift. And straight away, you weren't even at a side angle to me. You're like, James, engage your fucking lats. Don't let the bar move forward before you lift. And I've just failed a heavy lift. And I'm like, oh, do I rest? You're like, nah, get up, <laughs> fucking lift that up, squeeze your fucking lats. I was like, ah, oh, and I lifted it. Um, and you were completely right. Mm. I had it in the tank. I just uh, had given it the, the wrong thing. I'd actually had lazy lats from lifting too light all the fucking time. Mm, you mm, said that mm. to me. And this is in a low quality video, but in 45 seconds, I would have been, even with 5,000 hours of being a PT, I could have told everyone in the room, I cannot do this. Mm. And you were like, nah, fuck that. You just lifted it wrong. Mm. And I was like, wow. I was like, Baz is actually very clued up. And the same, <laughs> you, you've seen this as well with Sonny where Sonny will, I'll ask him something, the speed in which he responds to it. I've seen this with uh, world-class black belts in jiu-jitsu, whatever. But I often point people in your direction because you actually have a very good skill 
of understanding the mistakes people are having before they make their mistakes mm -hmm. and like set up for a bench press squat deadlift whatever it is some of your work in that field is is stellar like was that a practical thing a research thing how did you become one of the best resources on the internet for in essence no bullshit advice to help people lift I appreciate that. Thank you so much for those words, man. I've got a big head now, so you'll probably be able to see that on the video. But uh, I, I'd have to say it's definitely a combination of, of education, but time under the barbell was my best teacher. So, so there's not a program that I've prescribed that I haven't performed myself. I've been doing this for uh, 18, this is year 18 for me now, and I've been hands-on uh, in, in every part of the way. So... When I, was, when I first started as a personal trainer, it's one of the, the biggest issues that I see with people that are starting in the industry that fail and wonder why. Um, you know, the whole thing of entitlement. People come in and it's like, okay, I'm only going to be here for the hours that I'm getting paid for. Uh, you're not paying me. I'm out of here. I'm, I've got to do something else. I've got stuff to do. Um, you know, when I first started as a personal trainer, I just committed. I'd start the day, as whatever time I started, which was 6 a.m. because that's personal training hours. Anyone in the industry will know that. 6 a.m. and I finished, I don't know what time it was. It was a long day, 6 to 8 p.m. And I didn't have back-to-back -back clients within those times. And I just thought, what am I going to do? So I used to clean the gym floor, even though it wasn't my mess. Um, I used to train multiple times per day. I'd try out these programs myself. As a result, I made all of those mistakes. As you just said, you know, you saw the mistakes before they happened because I was the one that was making them. Um, I've made them on myself uh, many times. I've made um, you know, a lot of errors that have caused me injuries um, and uh, so many things like a decade ago that I used to preach and I used to know uh, were absolute crap. Um, but yeah, I, I'd have to say that time under the bar was my best teacher. Um, back to the point of being able to rub shoulders with some of the best in the industry, that's the beauty of this industry is... Uh, you know, you, you spend enough time in it, you get to meet literally the best, like I've, I've met and, and actually trained the strongest athletes on the planet. My mentors are the, are the strongest athletes, they're world record holders, and I'm good friends with them. Um, you know, I, I've got access to some of the best people in the industry as, as mates. And, um, you know, and that's, that's the beauty of living and breathing what you're doing. It just becomes second nature. Like I, it's, it's what I do. It's what my specialty is. It's not physiology. It's not nutrition. It's not, um, you know, of course I love science, but that's, that's um, there's an art, there's very much an art in, in everything that happens in the gym. And without that, uh, you're missing a huge part. So, so that's right. I see things um, very clearly when people move, and that's definitely my skill, is being able to make adjustments, uh, you know, Gross motor skills, put your arm here, put your leg there, take a big breath, put your eyes there, now push, uh, you know, and these are the cues that I quite often give and the response is instant in, in many cases and people look at it and go, you know, my, when I first uh, started getting good at this, I used to um, teach in a very different way. I used to give, you know, a lesson like that. Someone would like, how you did, you picked up that 200 kilograms and then you go off and I'm not sure if you applied it, I'm not sure what you did. I made it into a module, a module in my academy. No, I'm right. <laughs> if, if you didn't, you'd be silly not to, yeah. you know, to be honest with you. And, and that's an interesting thing as well, you know, when it comes to business and, and me as an educator. And that's something that I teach people. It's like, hey, you've just spent this time and money and effort learning from me. Don't go and think I need to change this because I don't want to plagiarize his work. Like it's yours, you know, like it worked for a fucking reason. You don't need to go and change it now just to, to, to be different. And, and the fact is, I didn't actually invent these methods either. You know, I didn't invent the squat, bench, press, deadlift. We're all standing on the shoulders of giants. Absolutely. And, you know, I know a lot of these giants that have helped me with, with you know, these are pioneers that I've worked with. Um, you know, big shout out to, to my first mentor, Ernie Lillybridge Sr. He's the father of Eric Lillybridge, uh, who squatted 480 kilograms uh, sorry, 477.5 kilograms in under 140 kilograms body weight. That's insane amount of weight. Um, their highest priority was squat. And so they taught me everything there is to know about a squat powerlifting style, I should say, because I don't do, there's lots of different styles of squatting. Um, but what he also taught me, this was quite interesting. It was the, it was the, the most valuable lesson. His uh, athlete was his son. Now, I don't know if it was because of his son, the amount of love that he gave his athlete, 
But that's I didn't look at it as a father son relationship. I looked at it as a coach athlete relationship. Um, something as simple as that, as as love and care and passion to the athlete, and how much that carried over to high level performance. And that's something that I give a lot of the people that I work with is is my time and and one hundred percent of me when I'm with them. And that gives so it's like Thor Bjornsson. I lived with him for for months before he won the world's strongest man and any of his events. We lived with him. When I say we, I took my family over to Iceland. We lived in his house. We cooked for him, cleaned for him. I, I loaded plates for him. I did fucking everything. You sit the fuck down. You've got to lift this 400 plus kilograms right now. This is easy for me. Let me do that work. Let me take that out of it. You just do this hard work. And, and you know, as a result, we get, you know, world titles, world records that stand to this day. Um, you know, he was known as, the one. you know, in 2018, he achieved... Uh, uh, more titles than anyone in the history of, of strongman on the planet. Uh, and it's like, what was it? Did I teach him how to squat, bench press, deadlift? D- d- no, actually. It was just working with him as a mate, um, you know, uh, attention to detail with, with small things that are quite trivial that you don't really learn about. Uh, and, and that can only be learned by spending time doing it yourself. So, so, um, there's not many people, like it's, it's the debate, you know, do you have to be a good athlete to be a good coach? Absolutely not. Some of the best coaches aren't athletes themselves, but they have a lot of experience. Um, but do I recommend it? Absolutely. Spending time under the barbell, something that I always say, when I train and I'm in a room with someone who, who hasn't felt the pain of squatting triple body weight or, or benching double body weight, they don't know what that feels like. And it's not just the 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 split second of what it feels like under the bar, what it feels like to put 10 years of work behind that to get to that point. And they come in and they start screaming, come on, let's go. And it's like, it's actually, um, it's useless noise to me. And it's quite distracting because that person hasn't felt my pain. Whereas when I'm working with my high level athletes, they respect me because they know that I know what they're going through. And, and, you know, I can empathize with a lot of my athletes and, and I've got guys that are 150 kilograms that look up to me and they trust me. And that's a really beautiful thing. And it's an unusual thing as well. It's like little old me. I make a joke and say little old me. I'm a hundred kilo guy. And, and you know, that's kind of above average, uh, but not in my gym. I'm, I'm well below. I'm the, I'm the little guy in here. Um, and, and so... Yeah, I, I guess I've, I always I quite I, I quite like to go off topic with my no 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 that's good and you've, with, you've, with my rants. I've heard you say before as well that you're not just their coach; they're your coach. Absolutely. When people ask me, "Do you have a coach?" I got a fucking team. I got a team that hold me accountable and vice versa. Um, I don't want to let them down and vice versa. And uh, it's it's a very different atmosphere here. And I'm not going to say that I'm the pioneer of that because I, I believe there's a lot of amazing coaches worldwide. Shout out to Louis Simmons, a Westside Barber, who just passed away. Yeah, he just died. And uh, that guy, uh, he, he, he made a mark in the strength world, um, arguably like no one else has. A lot of people nowadays, they look at his methods and say they're outdated and, and whatever. A lot of people like to tear him apart, which is what happens when you, when you become good. Uh, you get a lot of respect, but you get a lot of hate as well and criticism. It just goes, it's p- part of the parcel. I'm sure you know a little bit about that. Um, but, but that's where I see true success is when I see that people are like right in amongst it and they're not just observing from the outside, they're, they're feeling the pain as well. Um, and, and these are the people that I looked up to and, and I know a lot of them in the industry. So with moving on to kind of close this very engaging conversation, what's the future looking like for you? What projects are you working on? What would you like to draw people's attention to? Um, it has been for a while popularizing strength training for the masses. So, you know, this whole discussion is all about elite level athletes and it's intimidating. Um, the people that I work with, you know, squatting 400 kilograms and deadlifting the same amount and, and all of these numbers, it's, it's admirable and it's entertaining, just like going to a circus and, and looking at an elephant doing their thing. Um, but it doesn't relate to a lot of people. But my job... Well, my, my, um, my goal in the future is to teach people that it, it does relate to everybody. We don't, te- like the, the idea of me training my daughter, of course, was because I love my daughter and I want to help her. I'm not, 
people are asking me to train their children and to make money off it and I don't. I don't want to make money off it. That's not the reason why I, I did it. It's to teach people the techniques that I use at the best level in the world. That's the same techniques that I'm using on my daughter. And, and sh look at how she's responding. She's lifting more weights than a lot of fully grown adults. Um, you know, and that's not our goal. Our goal isn't to, for her to be a beast. I don't want her to be a, an elite level powerlifter or do any of those things right now. I want to develop her in, in whatever way I think is going to improve her future. And, and that's just the result. That's the end result. It's like, oh, wow, she's squatting 60 kilograms at 40 kilograms body weight and she's 12 years old. Uh, how does that happen? Well, she's following the principles that I'm talking about that I applied on Thor Bjornsson, who weighs 200 kilograms and, and deadlifted 501 kilograms. That's the technique that I'm using on this one. You know, it works. There's a, there's a few differences. There's a few major differences with how you train an absolute beginner to, to advanced. There's a lot of differences. There's also the mindset with that of someone going, how, how the fuck is a 14 year old squatting 60 kilograms? Let me tell you, started off at 59, then it was 58, then it was 57, then it was 56. Back in the day, it was fucking 40, and then it was 20. And people never have this approach to business or to life or to social media or whatever their endeavors. They always look at the strong person and go, oh, they're just strong. You're like, fuck you. There's so much work that goes on between that. And I think that it's great that even if your daughter never had a profession in weightlifting, she once stood in front of things she couldn't pick up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And over time, she worked her way towards it mm -hmm. until she could. Mm -hmm. I think if people, even if they're never interested in getting under a barbell or putting a plate on it, have that approach to things and... I love how you see that because a lot of people, even my wife, she's like, isn't that a bit heavy? And it's like, it would have been heavy if it was her first day, but it's not her first day. She started with not even a barbell and now barbells are 10 kilograms here. That used to be too heavy for her. And she started with nothing, just like all of us did, just like Thor Bjornsson did. All of us started with nothing and then you you know, intelligently apply the principles of progressive overload and then you give it time and effort and see what happens. And human beings know when it's too much. She will say, this, that's too heavy. Or, you know, I can't do that. And one thing as well that fucking grinds my gears is people are so afraid of failing. Like, there are obviously the physical implications of getting injured by trying to do too much. But fuck, if you're not on this precipice of being so close to the point that you cannot complete something, you're not in the right area. Unless you're uncomfortable in going through that, then, you know, if you remain with the weights that you know you can lift you're very rarely going to progress much to be an impressive amount of strength. It's, it's a personality thing, absolutely. Some people have that. I've heard people, when I perform on stage for my seminars, people have asked me, what if you miss the lift? And I'm like, I don't know, I haven't thought about that. Like, if I miss then I lift. Like, you did a good video this week about missing like, loads of lifts, like the compilation of putting them all together. Was that you? It was good. It was, Benny, yeah, it was yeah, Benny, it was Benny. Um, mate, that's been an amazing uh, chat for people that want to, Essentially, look at your online business, seminars, where do they go? Everything is Australian Strength Coach. My website, australianstrengthcoach.com, Instagram, at Australian Strength Coach. TikTok. We're going to get you on it. We're, we're going we're gonna to get going on, on TikTok. Apparently, it's the new thing. We'll see. There's already like 10 different points in this conversation. I'm excited to go on there. Thank you very much for coming on and having a Brother, chat. Brother, thank today. you so much for being here. I appreciate it so much, man. Cheers. Thanks.